Currently, Anissa is working for the University of Florida as operations manager at the Randall Research Center, which is part of the Florida Museum of Natural History. Anissa has lived in Florida since she was five years old. She grew up on the Southeast Coast. She has both a bachelor's and master's in wildlife ecology and conservation from the University of Florida. Anissa has worked as a naturalist for the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. She helped develop the curriculum for the Florida Master Naturalist Program. And she worked as both a biologist and a manager for Lee County's Department of Parks and Recreation. For a lot of us, uh, you know, our, our interest in indigenous peoples grow as we learn more and more about them. So I think that this will really inform uh, the audience about the Calusa, and I'm hoping that people will become um, interested to learn more. Well, so uh, this is um, an illustration of uh, one of the panels that we have at the Randall Research Center. Um, the interesting information about the Calusa comes from a number of lines of evidence. We have the texts that the Spanish had, you know, the when the Spanish uh, explorers came to the New World, they assigned people on their ships, especially uh, priests, to write about their encounters with the indigenous people. And so we have a lot of those texts. And we also have the artifacts uh, that we have found uh, along the Southwest Florida coast that informed us about the Calusa. But this is one of the panels that you will see if you come to Randell Research Center on top of Brown's Mound. And this is really what we believe um, Frank Hamilton Cushing saw, or something very similar to this. He, of course, the Calusa were gone uh, when he came in the late 1800s, but we believe that they had a really extensive uh, township here um, on Pine Island. And so this is uh, what we believe um, he saw. And so I encourage everybody to uh, come on out to the Randall Research Center and learn more about the Calusa. Um, and I can't start really my presentation about the Randell Research Center without speaking about Don and Pat Randell. Don and Pat Randell are our benefactors. They actually moved to Pine Island in the late 60s and they knew exactly what they had on their property. They had mounds left by indigenous peoples. And of course, this wasn't this wasn't a unique situation. As people moved to Florida, even on the East Coast, there were mounds uh, that people found left by indigenous people all over. Uh, but people, you know, really uh, didn't necessarily um, think that those mounds were anything special. So they started to tear them down. They would use them for road fill, um, for fill to build their homes. And so very quickly we were losing the archaeological evidence of the past. And so when Pat and Don Randell um, came to Pine Island and they saw mounds on their property, they decided that they were going to uh, not only preserve them, but find out more about them. And so uh, many of you probably know the famous author, Randy Wayne White. Randy Wayne White, before he became an author, was actually um, a starving author, right? And he, so at that point, he was uh, working for the news press, the Fort Myers news press, a local newspaper. Um, and he was very interested in this property as well. And so he uh, interviewed Don and Pat Randell, and he asked them about these mounds. He asked specifically what was in those mounds, and they famously said that, um, you know, uh, actually, uh, you know, they said, I don't dig in the mounds. I hope to have an expert do that someday, and so that's exactly um, what happened. In 1983, Don Randell funded an archaeological expedition down here to southwest Florida, and the first dig was not on um, Pine Island. It was actually a little island just west of Pine Island called Jocelyn Island that the Randells owned. And soon though, archeologists came to um, Pine Island and started digging in the mounds that Don and Pat Randell owned. Um, so in the year of 1989, the University of Florida actually uh, started something called the Year of the Indian Project where they actually brought Lee County children out to uh, witness some of these digs. Um, and this is really um, how a lot of people in the community became extremely interested, not only in archaeology, but specifically about learning more and more about the Calusa. You know, when you and I went to school, oftentimes we heard that um, 
that you couldn't have a complex society um, without having some sort of an agrarian lifestyle. You had to plant crops to support your people. And so when we started learning about the Calusa on the Southwest coast, that was actually turned on its ear. Uh, people always thought that these fisher gatherer hunters that lived in coastal environments that didn't plant crops, um, you know, people always thought, well, they were less advanced. They didn't have an advanced society. But as we learned more and more about the Calusa, we started to understand that, in fact, the Calusa did have very, very advanced, um, a very advanced society. And so that it was really, um, really quite fascinating. Um, in 1985, there was a dig going on at Randell Research Center. It wasn't yet named the Randell Research Center, but um, something very interesting was discovered. There was a small piece of bone discovered uh, on which uh, there was an etching of what people are calling a crane. It's a, certainly some, side, some sort of a bird, but that really lent to the idea that the Calusa were an advanced society. They had gone beyond just the basics of life. They um, were beyond just food, water, shelter, and space. They were creating art. They were carving. They were making masks. They were, um, you know, painting on their bodies. They're, they created deities. Um, and so we know all of this from, of course, the um, texts from the Spanish and what we've discovered. But this, this bone um, of this crane uh, became the emblem of the Randall Research Center itself. It really, um, it really showed that the Calusa were, um, were a, a society that cared about art and beauty as much as they cared about survival. Um, so the Randall Research Center soon after was established in 1996 when the Don and Pat Randall actually gifted um, 56 acres to the University of Florida. Um, but as I've said, archeological digs have been taking place uh, in the area since 1988. Uh, Randall Research Center, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are located on Pine Island in Northern Pine Island. We are part of the University of Florida and the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. If you are interested in actually seeing this artifact on display, we do not have it on Pine Island. We have it in Gainesville on display at the Florida Museum of Natural History. And if you're ever in the Gainesville area, I certainly encourage you to go to that museum. It is beautiful. Um, but if you want to see some Calusa um, indigenous mounds and learn more about the Calusa, I would encourage you to come out to Randall Research Center, where we kind of understand that it is, it is not just the study of archaeology, it is not just the study of history or ecology, but it is the combination of all three that informs us about the Calusa. And so that's really what we try to do. Our motto is, as we learn, we teach. And um, we learn a lot about archaeology, history, and ecology by studying uh, the Calusa. And as we learn, we do try to teach and inform our visitors about the Calusa. So if you look at this map, um, very quickly, you might see what seems like a mistake. Um, you see the word Tampa uh, right there on the um, coast of Pine Island, and it might seem um, erroneous, but in fact, it is not erroneous. Uh, Tampa actually was named first uh, right here in Southwest Florida. Um, in the days of the Calusa, this town was known as Tampa and an early map makers noted it there until 1683. The last evidence we have of Tampa being located in Southwest Florida was in 1683, but then in the 1700s, a map maker, our cartographer made a mistake um, and um, the, <laughs> the town of Tampa, the city of Tampa was placed north uh, where we consider Tampa to be today. So uh, we believe we are the first, the original Tampa, uh, but this map also shows you um, the estuary environment, which was so important for the success of the Calusa. So if you look at the top of the map, you, you see the entrance of the Mayaca and the Peace River into Charlotte Harbor. And uh, somewhere near the center of the map, uh, near Fort Myers, you see the Caloosahatchee River um, flowing through Fort Myers, through Cape Coral, into Pine Island Sound and San Carlos Bay. So you have this influx of fresh water and it mixes and meets with the salt water from the Gulf of Mexico. And when you have salt and fresh water mixed, 
that's brackish water. But when this brackish water is situated in a fairly shallow environment with um, water that doesn't move as quickly as it would necessarily in the Gulf, you create this amazing uh, environment, uh, this nursery for a lot of our uh, aquatic life, not only uh, fish, but um, you know, marine mammals, uh, certainly crabs, uh, seahorses, uh, sea anemones, urchins, um, manatee. So we have this amazing environment uh, that is incredibly biologically productive and the Calusa um, were able to live because of their knowledge of that biological productivity. The Calusa were extremely good at understanding how um, they could feed themselves and their huge populations. Um, huge, I say, you know, there were, uh, there are um, estimates of potentially 20,000 people um, in Southwest Florida and on Pineland. Um, you know, so the Calusa were extremely uh, proficient in understanding and providing for their populace um, through the um, use of the estuary. And we will talk about that a little more um, as we uh, move on. Um, but if you come out to Pine Island today, this is the side of one of our mounds. This is Brown's Mound. It's much less um, impressive, I suppose, than it was uh, back when the Calusa were here. Um, and partly because uh, this mound was, and many mounds were, were um, taken apart, right, to build roads. It wasn't until the Randells came that they stopped that. But certainly people had already started taking uh, from this mound. Um, but you can see that uh, beautiful tree in the center, the gumbo limbo with the red bark. Uh, that is one of the trees that um, we love to see in tropical hardwood hammocks and in coastal areas in South Florida. And it's certainly a huge part of um, the flora that you would see in uh, Randall Research Center. Um, and this tree has many uses. Uh, there was a young man that was held captive um, and actually lived with the Calusa uh, for 17 years. He called this tree uh, the tree of many uses, para muchas cosas, right? This tree that was used for many, many things. And so that is one of the things that the Calusa did. Not only were they able to take environment, uh, you know, take advantage of this hugely biologically productive estuary, but they used the flora and fauna around them. Um, Certainly in this picture, you can also see palms. So they wove fibers, they made nets, uh, they used gumbo limbo um, for uh, weights. They also used gumbo limbo to capture uh, birds. Um, as some of you probably know, the gumbo limbo has very sticky sap. So they would shave the top of the branch of a gumbo limbo and allow a cardinal or something to light on that branch and they would capture that bird. Um, and we have records of them trading cardinals with uh, Cuban fishermen um, in, um, in Cuba. So they had a huge trade route as well. But this is an example of one of the mounds that you would see if you came to visit us, which I certainly hope that you will do. Um, and again, this is, this is what we call the top of the world as Brown's Mound. Um, and we have seen this uh, used by a lot, but we know that it was created specifically for the uh, for Pine Island. At the time that the European, we had European contact, uh, Calusa culture was one in which um, they were able to really use their environment. The Europeans were not, were not ready to see such an advanced culture. They were politically complex in the way uh, that they created their culture. There were, as I said, fisher, uh, hunter gatherers. There were a about 20,000 people, um, and they were able to support an elite military um, force. They had principal leaders within their community. They had um, war captains and priests and deities. Uh, but if you think about the way that the Calusa created their society, it's not much different from a lot of extant societies that we know today. We know that cultures around the world create deities. There are many religions around the world, um, many people of faith. Uh, the Calusa were very similar. They were people of faith that, de that believed in their deities. They had their own trinity uh, that they believed in. And they also um, were ready for war when they had to go to war. But this is a really, really interesting um, landscape. Um, I spoke a little bit about Frank Hamilton Cushing. Um, he was the um, archaeologist, the that found the Key Marco Cat. Some of you may have already seen the Key Marco Cat at the Marco Island Historical Museum. If you haven't, I would strongly urge you to do that. 
But before Frank Hamilton Cushing went to Marco, he actually landed in uh, Pineland. He came to Pineland. They were, um, there were stories of uh, these indigenous mounds uh, on Pine Island. And so Frank Hamilton Cushing in the late 1800 came to see those mounds. Um, he, he arrived in 1895 and that was an incredibly cold winter. So what he was looking at was a pretty denuded landscape. He was looking at these mounds with trees on them, but with pretty much no leaves. And so he was able to see for miles. Um, for reference, the United States Census in 1900 shows approximately 36 people living on Pine Island. So when Frank Hamilton Cushing came in 1895, uh, we believe that what he saw there was very similar to what the Calusa probably left behind. And he understood very quickly that he was looking at um, probably the area where many, many indigenous people live. So before he went down to Marco, he mapped out the entire Pineland complex. And so these illustrations are based on his maps and his measurements. Certainly it doesn't look like that today, but that is kind of what he saw. And so that's what our illustrators uh, really took advantage of was those maps uh, to kind of show us what it might have looked like um, when the Calusa lived here. The Calusa did not only live um, and work in Southwest Florida, they worked throughout um, actually the Eastern uh, continent and even down into Cuba. They had a huge sphere of influence. Um, the Calusa traded with Cuban fishermen. They traded with uh, indigenous peoples that lived on the interior. Um, they certainly had influence all the way down to the Keys um, and they traded with uh, people throughout North America. Um, in, um, in the 1500s, we know that uh, Columbus came uh, to the New World um, and it wasn't, you know, uh, Columbus, and, and this is actually about Juan Ponce de Leon, that came in 1513. It wasn't a surprise to the Calusa that Juan Ponce de Leon was coming because of their sphere of influence, because of their ability to trade with, um, with other uh, groups of people. They had heard what was happening in March of 1513 in uh, Hispaniola. Um, they knew what was happening uh, that uh, Juan Ponce de Leon was um, was there. He was uh, trying to subsume that culture. Uh, there was some slave trading happening. Um, and so they were, they were ready for Juan Ponce de Leon. And so later, um, when Juan Ponce de Leon landed in, on the Southwest coast um, in 1521, the Calusa um, were ready. And uh, famously, this is the battle where Juan Ponce de Leon uh, was injured and later died uh, because of his injuries, but you can see uh, where uh, there are two converging um, red arrows. That's where the Calusa met Juan Ponce de Leon. You will see also in this map um, an area named Mount Key. Mount Key is the capital of the Calusa nation, we believe. We believe that there is that is where the chief lived, but Pineland was probably the second most populous area where there was a large um, population of Calusa. So the Calusa from Pineland and the Calusa from, um, from Mount Key got together and actually were able to defeat Juan Ponce de Leon as he moved on to um, the Southwest Florida coast. Um, a lot of times when we hear about the Calusa, we hear that they were a fierce people, that they were a warmongering people. And certainly they were good at, they were good at defending themselves, right? That is um, clear from what uh, their interactions were with Juan Ponce de Leon, but they weren't at war all the time. Uh, you have to kind of consider the source, right? Um, we have the texts uh, about the interactions with the Spanish and the Calusa from the Spanish themselves. And so every time the Spanish interacted with the Calusa, it was, a contentious uh, time, right? It was a time of battle, but we know from the writings um, of uh, the young man that stayed with the Calusa for 17 years that they had a daily life that was not necessarily um, consumed with war. And so uh, we have this um, illustration in front of us that kind of depicts the daily life. And you can see that the Calusa um, from this illustration, and this, this illustration certainly was informed by the texts and the archaeological evidence that we have, the Calusa lived on these mounds. They were able to um, 
able to subsist on uh, basically uh, what they found in the estuary. I don't want to um, I don't want to imply that they didn't grow anything. The Calusa did have small home gardens. They certainly grew uh, vegetables and fruits. They were able to take advantage of the native flora around them, but they did grow plants. Uh, we have found on Pine Island um, during one of our digs, papaya seeds that are over 1800 years old. So they certainly grew papaya, they grew chili uh, pepper seeds. Um, and when we do these archeological um, digs, um, you know, the first thing we see um, is that there's a lot of shells. You see a lot of mollusk shells, but as you start to dig more and more, um, you start to think about what kinds of life they live, because these shells, these middens, these mounds that they lived on were actually their refuse, right? It was the byproduct of what they were living on. So there's pottery, broken pottery, there's um, nets uh, that probably have degraded over time. We have found um, net material in wet sites and anaerobic conditions that were preserved, but anything that was organic that was in these mounds uh, certainly deteriorated. But you have these other things like pottery and the shells that made it. Um, and so this midden um, that they lived on was actually the debris of life and it was discarded uh, but this, mid this midden was built up rapidly so that they could live on top of it. Um, and so we understand that it's not necessarily what we find ins inside the midden. It's, um, you know, it's what we find out about what we find. And so um, we start to look at these shells that are left behind and we start to understand what a shell can tell. Um, you know, we, we start to look at what type of a shell it is how many of the type of shell uh, shells are present, um, and what we can learn about the environmental conditions of the shell. So um, we know that there are no hard stones or hard metals in Southwest Florida naturally. So the Calusa had to take advantage of those shells to start to build their environment around them. Humans are very good at altering the environment around them. We do it certainly, and cultures before us have done it for eons. So. Um, this is what the Calusa did as well. They created their environment. They engineered their environment by using these tools that they made out of shell. Uh, the lightning whelk is a shell that they used often to, uh, to use as a hammer, but they also created an adze where they could hollow out the middle of a canoe. They, they found many canoes in Florida, not only in North Florida, created by other indigenous peoples, but certainly in South Florida as well. And um, the shape of the canoe um, will tell you what type of water they were traveling in, whether it was a choppy water or quiet water. Um, and also um, it can show you that uh, many people can sit in that canoe. Uh, here we have an example of different types of oysters. And so um, if you look at this, it may not immediately tell you um, what you know about the environment. But if you look at the top, um, these are Eastern oysters, the, the shells on the top, those are Eastern oysters. And those oysters do best in lower salinities. So at times where we find that um, there are a lot of Eastern oysters, we know that there was uh, lower salinities at that point. We know that that is where uh, Calusa were, um, that's either when the sea level was further out and there was more of a freshwater influence um, and the Calusa were living on a coast where there were lower salinities. Um, or if you look on the bottom, uh, that's the uh, crested oyster. And the crested oyster uh, we find in times of higher salinity. So when we start to find these crested oyster shells um, in high numbers, we know that something happened to the salinity of the water. Either they were fishing in different areas or trying to get their, um, their food in different areas or the actual water table has had changed um, to allow for more salinity. And of course, when you look at the middens, when you look at these shell mounds, right, that's what a lot of people call them, shell mounds. They call them shell mounds because the most obvious thing you see um, are these shells. But when you look really, really um, closely, what you see is actually a lot of fish bones as well. And that informs us about the types of fishing activities that the Calusa 
were engaged in. You have the spotted sea trout, um, you know, on the very top, they can live eight to 10 years and they live inshore in sea grasses and around mangroves and oyster bars. Um, and so you know that they were fishing inshore um, and the spotted sea trout can die if the temperature of the water gets colder than 58 degrees. So if we're consistently seeing sea trout in the midden, um, we know that the waters weren't very cold. We know that they were fishing inshore. Um, now, the other, the other interesting thing, though, is that sea trout um, are pretty big. Um, so if you find the bones of mature sea trout, you know that they were not um, harvested by a net. They needed to be caught on hook and line. And so we look at the bones of the types of fish and the um, life history of the fish itself to inform us that uh, the Calusa may have made nets and may have used nets to fish, but certainly they did not caught, catch spotted sea trout with um, nets. They had to use hook and line. And so we know that the Calusa used hook and line. Um, the fish in the middle is a sheep's head. Um, it's medium size and they weigh a few pounds. Some can, of course, weigh up to 30 pounds. Um, and they spawn offshore in the late winter or spring. Um, and the young sheep's head live in sea grasses and mudflats. So um, if you see the bones of young sheep head that you know, again, they were uh, fishing inshore. Um, and then the, the fish at the very bottom, the red drum, um, they are a great fish to catch. Um, and they reach, um, when they're about four years old, they're about 30 inches long and they move offshore. Um, they eat shrimp and crabs and mullet. But if you see the bones of mature uh, red drum, you know that they were again caught offshore. And so the Calusa had a way of catching things offshore. So the types of bones that we find, this is how we understand how they were able to um, learn about and take advantage of their environment. They were fishing inshore, they were fishing with hook and line, they had nets, they were also fishing offshore, and their canoes had to take them offshore, and they had to have the ability to bring everything they caught back inshore. And so we understand that the Calusa were living in a time really where uh, they were able to feed primarily off of the estuary, um, and they were able to use nets not only to catch their fish, but also, um, you know, their, their nets were um, enabling them to um, catch a lot of pinfish, baitfish as well. Um, I talked about the sphere of influence. We know that the Calusa had connections throughout um, the Caribbean and uh, throughout uh, North America. We have found evidence of this because one, we find lightning welts that are usually associated with the Gulf Coast um, all the way up into North America. Uh, but we also find things like quartz crystals and galena in Pine Island in, uh, in our digs. And we know that that is not natural. That is not a natural thing to find in Southwest Florida. So we know that they had connections. They had certain trade routes. Um, and it is because of those trade routes that they kept communications open and were able to learn about the Spanish explorers when they were coming. Uh, the capital, um, the political capital of the Calusa was in fact on Mound Key. So not on Pine Island, but right off of Fort Myers Beach, Mound Key, which is, um, which is uh, preserved. And uh, we recently had uh, the uh, month of March was archeology span month and we celebrated the Calusa coast. And there were some, um, some trips out to Mound Key to interpret Mound Key, but Mound Key was the political capital. Um, and this is where Pedro Menendez um, meets the Calusa King in 1566. And um, he talks about uh, seeing ceremonies where there's dancing and food and, and big buildings. And they think that the buildings could hold hundreds of people. And so certainly the Calusa were able to create these large ceremonial areas as well. Um, and this is uh, some work that was done in Mount Key in uh, June of 2013 and 2014. There was more work done in 2018 where they did ground penetrating radar, excuse me, and they actually found the, the fort. There was, uh, in Spanish writings, there was, um, there was supposed to be a fort on Mount Key uh, that did not last. The Spanish were never able to subsume the Calusa, but there was supposed to be a fort. And through the work, um, there was in fact found that there was a fort on Mount Key um, in, uh, from 1567 to 1569. Uh, the 
Spanish were never able to keep that fort there. They were pushed out, but they were able uh, to build one uh, for a time. But archaeologists find uh, evidence not only of the Calusa, but also of Spanish and Calusa interactions. And I talked about the deities. The Calusa certainly had deities, and this is an, um, a representation of the deities they had. Um, they had a trinity of uh, three powerful spirits, um, and um, this informed the way that they lived. Uh, there was a, a god, well, they didn't call it a god. I will call it a deity, a deity of war, a deity of um, worldly things, and a deity of the way that you governed yourself. So um, if you come to uh, Randall Research Center, which again, I hope you do, uh, we can certainly talk more about um, the Calusa culture and the deities. And this is actually an illustration that we have on a sign that will take you out to uh, the burial mound that we have on the property. And the burial mound um, is, uh, we, we don't allow people on top of the burial mound, but the Calusa did have ceremonies and uh, they have their own religion where they revered um, the dead and they created ceremonies um, to show reverence for the dead. And so the Calusa were an extremely interesting, um, interesting tribe. Um, they, there are no Calusa left today, uh, but because of the archaeological work that we've done on Pine Islands and on Mount Key, we understand that they were able to be quite successful in the way that they lived in Southwest Florida, um, and primarily because of the um, health of the estuary. And that is, that, that's pretty similar to uh, the reason that societies today are able to live, right? We know that um, it is because of a healthy well-functioning environment that our societies are able to continue to live um, with a high quality of life. And so that's what we're hoping to continue these uh, healthy functioning environments. But if you come out to Randall Research Center, uh, you'll get um, a really nice view of what uh, the Calusa were. Um, we have some amazing docents. We also have some amazing flora and fauna that I, uh, that I hope that uh, you'll come out to see. So thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak about uh, the Randall Research Center and the Calusa. I've given you just a little bit of what we know about the Calusa and I certainly hope that you will come out and uh, visit us uh, sometime soon. So if you are enjoying watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe for more. Um, that's an interesting, um, interesting question. Uh, not, not necessarily. So there have been archaeological digs. We know that the Calusa were on Pine Island for since at least about 50 AD. Uh, there have been digs, as I said, all along uh, Pine Island Sound, and we have um, evidence of uh, prehistoric people there for 6,000 years. Um, where they came from, we're not quite sure. Um, some, you know, they could have come from the uh, Yucatan Peninsula, or they could have come from the um, the the land bridge um, across the uh, northern Pacific, but um, that is unsure. We don't really have enough evidence uh, or pieces of the puzzle to put together uh, how they got there or when exactly they got there. Um, and really, this is this is an interesting point, right? Like, at what point do you say those people were not Calusa, but these people were Calusa? As our culture kind of evolves, there are certain things that we find uh, more useful, so we do more of that, and certain things that become less useful. As we innovate new things, we stop using old things, but does that mean that we rename our culture at a certain point? I don't know. So um, nobody really knows where they came from, but that is certainly another um, line of, um, of, of uh, research that a lot of people are interested in. That's a very good question. So we are we are open daily from sunrise to sunset. Um, our gift store is open from Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We do not have a museum per se. We do have replicas 
of artifacts and we have replicas of tools that the Calusa used. And um, when our gift store is open, our classroom is open as well. Um, but anyone can come by any day of the week from sunrise to sunset and do a self-guided tour. Uh, if you go on our website uh, for the Randall Research Center or you go on our Facebook page, you can keep up to date with what's happening there. And during season, we actually have a number of guided tours that are available for people. But if, if you wanna get a group of people together, six people or more, and um, give me a call, I can certainly arrange a private tour. We have some fantastic docents that would love to show you around. You do need a boat. Um, so I would definitely um, speak to the um, biologists at Lover's Key and at Correction State Park. It's easiest, I think, to get from Correction um, to Mound Key by water if you have a canoe, but I would definitely take a guide. And the biologists at um, Correction State Park and Lover's Key um, can, can, can show you how to get there. I think there are some tour boats that might take you near Mound Key, but I don't know if they actually land there um, specifically. Um, but yeah, Mound Key is, is difficult to get to. But if you want to, if you want to, see some um some mounds left behind i do encourage you to come out to pine island um and visit us uh we have two mounds that you can go on top of um and a burial mound as well so um that might pique your interest a little more and certainly uh, i would keep an eye out for tours to mound key from uh, correction and lovers key state parks Um, that is actually a piece of bone. We believe that it may have been a piece of deer bone um, and potentially something that they used uh, to put in their hair. Um, you know, a lot of uh, people with long hair, when they put their hair back, they need something to keep it back there. And so um, a lot of times, uh, and we see this in a lot of cultures, they use bones or sticks to kind of... Um, Put in their hair but that that was a piece of bone a very delicate exquisite piece of bone that's only about an inch long but it had been it had been broken so the part of the crane was obvious but it was not a it was not an entire piece of bone so it had been broken at a certain point but we think that it was probably a um a bone um of, of a deer i want to thank you for your presentation and, it was um, my pleasure. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak about uh, the Calusa and Pine Island. And I certainly hope that um, I'll be able to um, walk some folks around Randall Research Center and show them the mounds uh, up in person.